about you, but I've enjoyed preaching at least this series because I'm learning more about the miracles that Jesus performed in the book of John. And, and up to now, I mean, we're on the sixth sign, the sixth miracle that Jesus has performed where he makes a blind man receive sight. But some of these miracles have been really exciting, just starting off with the, the first one of, of the water that he turned into wine, you know. And to me, I always say that in every single marriage that I do. People ask me all the time to stand up and, and to say a prayer over their marriage. And, and uh, so I'll be at the reception and I'll be blessing the food. And I'll tell people to drink responsibly. But I always remind them that, listen, the very first miracle is that Jesus turned water into wine. And I think it's because he wanted to keep the party going. He wanted to, uh, they used to party for a whole week, and he wanted it to be a celebration, a time of getting together, a time of fellowship, a time of happiness, and he didn't want to disgrace the bridegroom who had run out of wine. And so God cares about our disgrace, and he cares about picking us up, and he cares about us actually being able to look good and for not being criticized by others. And then we continue on with these these different miracles, and, and this week we get to... Um, not just Jesus healing a lame person as we saw in the fifth miracle, but now we get, or the fourth miracle, but now we get to see Jesus actually heal a blind man. And then next week, Jesus does the miracle above all miracles where he raises a dead man back to life. He takes Lazarus out of the tomb after being dead for three days. You can just imagine the powerful sermon we're going to have next week, and then we're going to have a time of communion because that's exactly what Jesus did when he instituted communion, was that we are to remember the resurrection. And when we take into that bread and that wine, we are remembering that. So that's that next week. But open up your Bibles to John 9, 1 through 11. We'll be reading John 9, 1 through 11. And this is what the word says. As he went along, he saw a blind man from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begged, asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, no, he only looks like the man. But he himself said, I am the man. How then? Were your eyes opened, they asked. He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash, so I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is this man, they asked him. I don't know, he said. Let's pray together. Father God, I just ask that as I speak this message of your Bible, may it be accurate, may it be true, may it be a word that we can apply to our daily lives, Lord. Um, may the thoughts that... And the points from this passage, may we be able to place ourselves in the story and may it transform our lives. It's not just about knowledge, Lord. We want it to be transformational and be able to apply it. So bless us with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There's a couple different components to this story. And what I want is for you to be able to see, if you can, and be able to place yourself within the story. The story starts out with darkness. It starts out with darkness, then it moves to light, then it moves to sight, and then it moves to darkness again. So there's, there's a movement within the story. It starts out with darkness, it moves to light, 
it then moves to sight and then it moves to darkness again and what I'm hoping is that somewhere you will be able to see yourself within the story maybe there's a place of of darkness in your life where you just can't see Maybe there's a, a, a light that needs to be revealed to you and you're hoping for Jesus to reveal that light. And then once you see, it's just that aha, aha moment where your eyes are open and you can see, but then the danger is always moving back to darkness again. Let's see in the story as, as it says, as he went along, this is Jesus. And Jesus had been teaching the crowds we had seen in the last few miracles, okay? Jesus had been multiplying the fish and the bread and, and crowds were swarming over him. And there wasn't a whole lot of healing within the Bible up to the point of Jesus, okay? We saw people sickness. We saw people with ailments. We saw people who were lame in the Bible all the time, but there wasn't a whole lot of healing going on. In fact, if you read through the whole Old Testament, you don't see very much healing. You see God interacting with his people, but you don't see a whole lot of healing. Within the first 30 years, Jesus didn't heal. And so we do have some false gospels out there that talk about Jesus as a boy doing some miraculous signs and things. And notice they're not in our Bible because um, the agreement within the ch Christian church fathers has been that those Bible's books aren't really true. You know, it's, it's some made-up stories. They're cool stories to hear. But we don't see any miracles happen within the first 30 years. It's within these last three years that Jesus actually begins to do some miracles and wants to show on the scene leading up to the resurrection that God is at work in him and that he can do all things. And so we don't see a lot of healing. And so this is why the disciples ask their question. The disciples are very used to people being sick. The disciples are very used to people um, having diseases, blindness, or being lame, or being paralyzed. And it's just become a daily way of life. It's kind of like when you drive through different parts of the town and you see beggars out there who are asking for money at the street corners. You go to different states and you just don't see that. That doesn't exist. And so when people come down here to Miami and they see a lot of that, they're so surprised. And they mention that to me all the time. Like, there's a lot of people on the corners looking for, for some money, looking for some handouts to be able to survive. I said, yeah, that is. It's a common way of life here. But back then, the common way of life was people being sick. They lived in a period of darkness. We know that this, this sickness comes from sin, the disciples had that same thought process when they asked Jesus Christ. He said his disciples asked him in verse 2, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now, yes, because of sin entering into the world in Genesis 3, we learn that after that, the world began to break down. Okay, we see that within the first relationship between Adam and Eve. God created Eve for Adam. He married them off. He gave them uh, the ability to work within the garden. And he, he said, go off and name these animals, name these trees, name these plants. Steward over my creation. That's your responsibility. So he gave them purpose. He gave them work. And then what happens is Genesis 3, they both decide to sin against God. Eve first, when she took the fruit, Adam in his quietness, because he was there next to Eve and never spoke up against it, and so they both decide to sin. They both eat of the fruit. And then the relationship begins to break down. After that, creation begins to break down. And what God promises is for death to enter into creation actually becomes fulfilled. Because people become sick. People begin to die. Before sin, there was no death. After sin, there was death. And so the disciples said, hey, listen, who sinned? Why is this man born blind? Who's responsible for it? Is it his sin? Or is it his parents' sin? And what they're remembering is from Exodus 20 and some of the Old Testament passages where it says that because of your parents' sin, that some of your ailments, some of your sins can be passed down to four, five, six, seven generations on down the line. Which is true in many cases. In many cases, if, if you grew up with a parent who was rather abusive, then a lot of times that will affect you in some way, and it will affect your children after you. You grew up with somebody who's an alcoholic. You know that from 
living in that situation, you have a decision to make when you become an adult. Either you will become an alcoholic or you'll abstain from it. And then a lot of times what will happen is that abuse or that effect of the abuse will be passed down many generations. And I think that's what God is talking about. He says that there's some curses here as parents that we put on our kids. There's some responsibilities here as parents that we're to actually influence our children and we can influence them for the negative or we can influence them for the positive and we do affect them. And then there is a God who is a recreator. There is a God who uh, can do all things and he says for us to break that curse. He gives us uh, the command to actually live differently. But the disciples are asking that question. Who's responsible, this man or the parents? In this situation, when children are born with some deficiency or when we are, have some deficiency in our life, it's not always because of a sin. Yes, the world is broken because of sin. So deficiencies happen. People are born blind or colorblind. People are born where they cannot walk. People are born where they cannot completely think for themselves and we do have different levels of IQ and everything else. But that's not because of our direct sin. Sometimes it's just because sin is in the world. And that's what Jesus actually says here. He addresses it. He says, verse 3, neither this man nor his parents sin. See, Jesus cuts right down to the theological issue of saying it's not because of this man's sin that he was blind. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Now, can you imagine being born blind? I mean, if we lose our sight today, then, and you were to close your eyes. In fact, everyone should try this. I asked my group to do this this week, and I thought it was really cool. Uh, sometimes my group, when they come over to my house and we do power group Bible studies together, they give me illustrations for my sermons. And so I love meeting with them. And I just ask them, close your eyes. Can you close your eyes today? Close, close your eyes this morning. And when you close your eyes, you still have pictures in your mind. Your imagination begins to drift off to a place. You can picture yourself even on a beach. You should do this. I ask my, my wife to do this sometimes when she's stressed and, and upset. And I say, just close your eyes and picture yourself on the beach. The sun is shining on you. There's waves crashing over. You can hear them in the distance. Shh. You're just enjoying that sun shining down on your face. You're hitting the lawn chair, absorbing it all in. Now open your eyes. I'm going to bring you back this morning because I don't want to keep you on the beach. You guys pictured it, didn't you? You guys were there. You guys were present. You see, we have pictures in our mind because we've been there. We've experienced it. We know what it's like. And so even if we were to close our eyes, even if we were to lose our sight today, we can have pictures within our minds that recall the information. This blind man was born blind at birth. He does not have any pictures to recall. He is living in complete darkness. He doesn't know what it's like to see the beach. He doesn't know what it's like to experience the sun. He doesn't know what women look like. He doesn't know what his mother looked like. He doesn't know what his father looked like or his brothers or his siblings. He doesn't know what it's like to experience a flower growing or the bee buzzing around it. He doesn't know any of that because he's living in complete darkness. He was born blind at birth. This darkness that he experiences. And it says... This is what it happened, so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. You see, Jesus is setting the disciples up. Jesus is trying to teach the disciples. He's been teaching the crowds for all of these different miracles, but he knows that within the next couple months, he's going to go to the cross. He knows his time is running out, his time is running short. So he begins to focus in on the leaders that he will build up in the church because they will carry on the mission and the work when he is gone. So he begins to teach them individually and he sits his disciples down and they're asking him questions. He begins to answer it as a good teacher. And he says, listen, this man was born blind so you can see that I am the light of the world. Now some of you in here, might feel like there's darkness. 
in your life. Some of you in here, you're, you're looking for an answer. You're looking for a solution. You don't know what God's doing. You're wondering what the will of God is right now in your life. And it just feels like I'm just left depending on God. I'm living in darkness. And Jesus comes into the scene. And he says, I am the light of the world. What's amazing about this passage, if we focus on the man who was born blind, is I love what Mark Batterson says. Mark Batterson tells us, he's a pastor, and we've been watching his videos in our Bible studies. And one of the things he tells us in this Bible study as we're watching this video is that children normally begin to develop their eyesight around six months old. And so their very first images, their very first pictures that they're able to absorb in and see is about six months old and they, they see clearly their, their mom and about nine months old they begin to see their dad. And there's a window of time where a child needs to actually develop its eyesight, where the brain needs to connect with the wiring in order to be able to see. And if that does not happen, a person will grow up blind. And there's no way that doctors can actually regenerate those connections within the brain for that child to be able to see or for that adult to be able to see. So if we have sight when we're born and then we go blind later on, there are some corrective surgeries that people can perform over us in order to... Um, try to get our sight back. We have cataract surgeries. We have different things that ophthalmologists can do. However, if a child does not have those connections within the brain, there's nothing they can do. The eye is too complex for us to figure out how to generate those connections. And so here is a man who you would guess has run out of time. Here is a man who has outlived that window of time for the brain to make the connections. Stay with me. I'm going somewhere with this. And so, Jesus steps in and says, even though this man has run out of time, even though this individual has not made the connections, I am the God of the universe in human form, and I can heal this man. I can do beyond what any other person can do. I can regenerate the connections within his brain for this man to have sight. That is an amazing thing that God can do because it shows us that God doesn't just create, which he did in Genesis, but God does recreate. We are not limited to time and space when it comes to our relationship with God. We are not limited within time or space when we depend fully on God Christians live outside the boundaries because God can do all things. I'm going to bring you back to the Old Testament story of Abraham and Sarah. We go to Genesis 15. It actually starts in Genesis 12 where God had come to Abraham and he says, listen, I want you to leave everything behind and I want you to follow me. He says, okay, I'll do that. Where are we going? I'm not going to tell you. You just need to trust. You just need to follow me. You need to leave your family behind. You need to leave your country behind. You need to leave your possessions behind. Just take what you can carry and come follow me to this new land that I'll take you. Starts there. Then Genesis 15 rolls around and God gives him a promise. God says, listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a son. Abram looks at God and says, okay, I believe you, God. I'll trust in you. Abram waits for 20-something years. God still doesn't give him a son. Genesis 17 rolls around and he begins to kind of laugh at God. He begins to kind of mock him. Say, you know what? You told me that you were going to give me all of these children. Your blessing was that you were going to outnumber my children with the stars. When I look up to heaven and I see the stars in the sky at night, I was going to have more children than this. I don't even have one child. God says, you will have a child. You see... Abram at that point was living in darkness. Gets to the point where Sarah is 99, about 90 years old. Abram's probably about 100 at this point. Abram's 99. She's 90 years old. And she becomes pregnant. She actually laughs at God because she does not believe that God could make her pregnant at her old age. You see, when we depend fully on God, what can happen is that we God can do all things. He can do a miracle. We are not limited to the time and space of logic. 
because we have God and God can create and he can recreate. So he takes this individual, this blind man, and he recreates sight within him and he does it for a purpose. But this happens so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Jesus wanted to show his disciples very specifically that he is the light of the world. He wanted to do this miracle to show them that I can take someone who is blind, who can't see, and give them sight. I can show them. So Jesus is the answer to when we're blind and we don't know what's going on with our lives. Jesus is the answer for when we're blind and we're spiritually dead. You see, the Bible tells us that we are spiritually dead in our sin from when we're born. And it's some Somewhere in our life that we need to actually experience the relationship with Jesus Christ, accept what he's done for us, that he's died on the cross for our sin, and believe in that. And that belief generates light for us. And so verses 1 through 4 is darkness. This man is living in darkness. Verse 5, Jesus comes onto the scene and he brings on light. It's the same way in the beginning when God created the Father. The Father was, there was darkness. There was nothing there. God shows up on the scene and he creates the sun. He creates the moon. He creates the stars. He creates light. Wherever God is, there is light. He brings light into the darkness. And so Jesus is trying to show that very specifically. I am the light of the world. I have come for, to show people their wrongs. I have come to show people where they've fallen short. I've come to show people where they've made mistakes. They've been living in darkness. But now I'm going to light things up and reveal it so that they can actually be different and live differently. It's a wonderful thing, God. It's dark in a room and we can't find our way around. We don't know where the walls are. We don't, we're going to bump into stuff. We're going to hit our, our legs or stub our toes. We're going to fall down. And then someone turns on a light and it's like, oh, I can see again. I can see for the very first time. I have light. I can see things around me. That's what Jesus Christ does on this scene for a very specific purpose. But how does he do that? Let's read on in verse 6. How does he do that? He goes, after saying this, he spit on the ground made some mud with the saliva and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means scent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. Now, here's the thing that puzzles me that just spoke to me in this passage, and I hope it will speak to you too. Why did Jesus actually bend down onto the ground, spit, which is kind of gross. Can you just make... Ah! And it was enough spit to actually make mud, right? I mean, it's like, did, was it just one loogie? Was it five? You know, it's like, and, and makes a pile of mud, picks it up and rubs it on the man's eye. I tell you, some of the things that God does in the Bible is just like, whoa. You know, if I was that man, like, okay, I'm blind and you're spitting on me and you're rubbing mud on me and I'm going to sit there and say, hallelujah, praise the Lord. I mean, some of us as Christians, we wonder, God, why are you letting some of this stuff happen in my lives? Why are you letting me go through this? Why are you doing this to me? And you can just imagine that this man's wearing spit. He's wearing mud. God's putting him through this, but he's doing it for a reason. He's doing it for a purpose. There's something coming at the end of the story. But I go, why didn't Jesus just wave his hand over the man's eyes and say, be healed? He's God. It's just like this magic wand he could have done. There's a reason that Jesus actually spit on his eyes, made some mud. We don't know the reason why it was mud. We don't know the reason why it was spit. But there's something that he tells him to go and do. There's something that he actually commands him to do. Because every single miracle, every single supernatural thing that happens begins with a natural response. And it begins with a natural response of faith on your part. Sometimes we're not seeing the miracles of God because we're not having the faith to actually be obedient to the things that God is calling us to do. You see, God tells us to do some things in his word and sometimes we're not seeing God show up in our life. We're not seeing him work because we haven't done our part for the miracle to take place. We're not fully trusting. We're not fully being obedient. We're not fully surrendering to what he's called us to do for the miracle to actually take place. And so Jesus tells this man, he says, hey, you, blind man with spit on your eyes, 
Go wash in the pool of Siloam. Now, this pool was kind of cool. If you do some research on this pool, uh, the, the pool of Siloam was um, a pool that was man-made and it was invented because it came from, uh, there's actually a natural body of water outside the city. And in Hezekiah's time, this natural body of water, which was Gihon, was, was believed that if they ever became in war, if they were ever attacked, what could happen is they had a fear that the Assyrians would come in and they would cut off their water supply. And so during Hezekiah's reign, he actually ordered for um, some canals to be tunneled underneath the walls of the city. And they became part of this pool of Siloam, which means scent. And so he, the people would go to this pool of Siloam and they would actually gather the water together for the festivals. And so this, this water was, was known and they were celebrating this festival as a remembrance from when the people were in the desert and they were walking around and they were crying out to God for some water and they were hot and they were thirsty. And Moses got frustrated with them and he smacked the rock with his staff. The water sprang out. You guys know that story? And so the water sprang out and God supernaturally provided for the people with water. Jesus tells the same kind of principle when he says, hey, you, I'm the light of the world. What else did he also say? Not only is he the light of the world, but he told people that if they drink his water, that he is the living water, that they will never be thirsty again. So Jesus sends this man down to a pool that was built that they were taking water from a festival to remember what God had done for all of the people. Jesus is sending this man to that pool in remembrance of what God providing for his people had done, telling him with spit on his eyes that I am the living water. And he tells him to go down there and wash. And so when the man goes down and washed, can you just imagine being blind with spit in your eyes and trying to work your way through the crowds? It's festival time. You don't know where you're going. We don't know how far it is, but we know it wasn't close. We know if it was built with canals that the man had to walk downstairs. We know that the man had to walk some distance. It doesn't tell us that there were friends that went along with the man. It doesn't tell us that there were people that held his hand. He had to work his way there. God is trying to show this man something in his life. He's trying to show this individual, this blind man, that he can do it. And when he does do it, and when he's obedient to him, even when it's hard... God's going to do something in his life. I got a video that I wanted to show you this morning. It's taken from a clip from um, Facing the Giants. And sometimes in life, we can begin to make excuses, don't we? When things get tough, when things get hard, don't we sometimes make excuses and just say, we can't do this? We, we, we can't fulfill what we're being asked for. It's too hard. It's too difficult. The truth when we say that is we just don't want to. We just don't want to. We don't believe in ourselves or believe in God that we have the ability enough to do what God actually asks us to do. And so this clip is an inspirational clip that shows that we can do far more than what we think and that we're capable of. And uh, I hope it speaks to you this morning. So, Coach, how strong is Westview this year? A lot stronger than we are. You already written Friday night down as a loss, Brock? Well, not if I knew we could beat them. Come here, Brock. You too, Jeremy. What, am I in trouble now? Not yet. I want to see you do the death crawl again, except I want to see your absolute best. <laughs> <laughs> what, you want me to go to the 30? I think you can go to the 50. 50. I can go the 50 if nobody's on my back. I think you can do it with Jeremy on your back. But even if you can, I want you to promise me you're going to do your best. All right. Your best. Okay. You going to give me your best? I'm going to give you my best. All right, one more thing. I want you to do it blindfolded. Why? Because I want you giving up at a certain point when you can go further. Get down. Jeremy, get on his back. <laughs> I get a good tight hold, Jeremy. All right, let's go, Brock. Keep your knees off the ground, just your hands and feet. There you go. A little bit left. A little bit left. There you go. Show me good effort. That way, Brock. You keep coming. There you go. 
a good start. A little bit left. A little bit left. There you go, Brock. Good strength. <laughs> That's it, Brock. That's it. Not the 20 yet. Forget the 20. You give me your best. You keep going. That's it. No, don't stop, Brock. You got more in you than that. I ain't done. I'm just resting a second. You gotta keep moving. Let's keep moving. Let's go. Don't quit till you got nothing left. There you go. Keep moving. Keep moving. Keep moving, Brock. That's it. You keep driving. Keep your knees off the ground. Keep driving it. Your very best. Your very best. Your very best. Keep moving, Brock. That's it. That's it. That's it. Keep going. Don't quit on me. Keep going. Keep driving it. Keep driving. Keep your knees off the ground. That's it. Your very best. Don't quit on me. Your very best. Keep driving. Keep driving. There you go. There you go. That's it. You keep driving. Keep your knees off the ground. Keep driving it. Don't quit till you got nothing left. Keep moving, Brock. That's it. That's it. That's it. Keep going. I want everything you got. Come on, keep going. It hurts. Don't quit on me. Your very best. Keep driving. Keep driving. There you go. There you go. He's heavy. I know I'm, he's heavy. I'm bad out of strength. Then you negotiate with your body to find more strength, but don't you give up on me, Brock. You keep going, you hear me? You keep going. You're doing good. You keep going. Do not quit on me. You keep going. It hurts. I know it hurts. You keep going. You keep going. It's all hard from here. 30 more steps. You keep going, Brock. Come on. Keep going. Burn. And let it burn. My arms are burning. It's all hard. You keep going, Brock. Come on. Come on. Keep going. You promised me your best. Your best. Don't stop. Keep going. Too hard. It's not too hard. You keep going. Come on, Brock. Give me more. Give me more. Keep going. 20 more steps. 20 more. Keep going, Brock. Give me your best. Don't quit! No! Keep going! Keep going! Keep going! Don't quit! Don't quit! Don't quit! Brock Kelly, you don't quit! Keep going! Keep going! Go, Brock Kelly! You don't quit on me! No! You keep going! You keep going! Go, Brock! Ten more steps! Ten more! Ten more! Ten more! Keep going! Don't quit! Give me your heart! You can! You can! Five more, five more, come on, Brock, come on, don't quit, don't quit, come on, Brock, two more, one more. Oh. It's got to be 50, it's got to be 50, I'll have any more. Look up, Brock, you're in the end zone. says you're in the end zone you're in the end zone you can do far more you just went across the entire football field with a man on your back you thought you could only make it to the 20-yard line you made it the complete distance of the football field you are in the end zone what he tells him is that he can do far more than what he thought he was capable of I think God's the same way God tells us you can do far more than what you think you're capable of you guys think you can only go 20 yards I'm telling you with my help with me screaming at you with me encouraging you with me yelling at you if you can be obedient you can change the things in your life you can make it the distance of the football field I won't stop on you I will continue continue working in your life but you need, you need to be willing to be obedient to me to be willing to actually get on your hands and knees and to listen and keep going and keep struggling and keep fighting through it and I'll be there for you I will grant you exactly what you need I'll be your your coach I'll be your mentor I'll be your encourager I'll be your friend Jesus is on his hands and knees with us scaling that football field with us but he says you need to do it this blind man needed to work his way down into the pool and once he was completely obedient and surrendered everything to Jesus what does Jesus do he restores his sight I love this story this story is a story of God showing up and doing something in someone's life when they thought that it was never gonna happen the, the paralyzed man the same way, 38 years paralyzed. The blind man as an adult, blind his entire life. God shows up and show, says that he can do all things no matter what time limit. Don't place a time limit on God. Do something and be obedient. And what he happens is, is that Jesus shows up and restores this man's sight. 
I got to tell you a story, and, and I'm, I'm coming to the end, I know. Um, my wife at one point was, we were praying for a job for her. We were up in Michigan, we had just moved up there, and um, we were praying for a job, and, and there was one that she really, really wanted, and we're like, that would be perfect for her, and, and she applied, and she made it down to the final two candidates. And so we're praying, we're praying hard. And uh, what had happened was that they had ended up, like most companies do, promoting somebody from within, and that other person got the position. She came home just as discouraged. We're like, oh, this is darkness. But you know what? We decided to have faith. So we're going to have faith. We're going to choose to have faith that God has something else for you in mind. Turns out later that three days later she gets a phone call and says, listen, we really appreciate you coming in and interviewing you. We really liked you. Um, this other person that we promoted within, could you have, would you be willing to go and apply for her job? We thought about it. We were like, you know what? It pays a little less. doesn't have as many hours. But we're going to do it. And she goes and she actually um, interviews for that position and gets it. You know what happens is sometimes we don't understand why God does what he does. About six months later, the position that the other person had been promoted in, that whole department had shut down. That whole department closed. That person was out of a job. And I felt bad for that person and that person went on and, and we kept in contact and she went on and got a different job and a better job actually. But my wife, worked for that in the position she was hired into and worked her way up and was there for seven, eight years working that position. Sometimes we don't understand why God does what he does. We're living in the darkness and we're just questioning and we're wondering why. Why God? Why are you doing this? Why, why does this happen? And we just need to have faith. We need to be obedient. We need to believe that there's a reason, there's a purpose. And when we are obedient and when we do have faith, when we walk that distance and we go and wash, then God will give us sight. He will heal us. He will show up for us. Last uh, story is sometimes we question the will of God. And Josue, we're going to go right into song. So if you want to uh, start playing, you can, but... Sometimes we question the will of God and we wonder, have we failed God somewhere in our life? God wants us to do this and did we do this? God, we, we, our, our way is plan A and, and God's way was plan B. Did, what is God's will for my life? You know what this story, this miracle communicates to me? And this is what I want you to take home from this. Is that no matter what our decision is, whether we've made a mistake, whether we thought God's plan was plan B when we chose plan A, no matter what we did, sometimes God's will, whether we're walking in it or not, He can recreate it for us. He can redo something in our life. It's not too late. We're, even if we make mistakes, He redeems us, so He redeems our mistakes. That's what I love about this story. You see, there was a time period where I got felt the call to go into seminary and I shared this with my group I I moved up to Michigan and went to school for a year my wife became pregnant with our our first child and after that child was born about two weeks she experienced a, a, a severe post-traumatic depression um, that can happen postpartum depression and we had come back down to visit family and friends and, and going back um, we just felt very lonely at that time we experienced wonderful support being down here on vacation for two weeks and then we went back home and we were very, very lonely. And so we said, you know what, let's just move back. Let's move back to Florida. It'd be good for us. So we moved back to Florida from where I was going to school at and um, thought, you know, I'll just finish my schooling down there. Got a job at the airport, was uh, unloading planes and loading in planes and discovered there's not very many Bible schools down here in South Florida. You know, God needs to do some work down here because there needs to be some more Bible schools. And there wasn't very many at the time. And I remember sitting at the edge of the bed talking to my wife and we were kind of crying and, and um, talking with some friends of ours. And we, I just felt like I had abandoned God at that point. Not my relationship, my personal relationship with God, but I abandoned my calling. God had sent me to school to study his word, to become a pastor, and we had moved back and we were outside of his will. And I felt that. And I got to tell you that sometimes even whether that was a mistake to move back or whether it was God's will or it wasn't his will, I don't know. Sometimes we just don't know the will of God. 
because it's not specific. There's certain things that the Bible says to be obedient to, and there's, there's certain things that, you know, whether it's plan A or plan B. But what I want you to see this morning from this story is that no matter what you decide, God can recreate his will in your life. It's never too late. No matter what mistake, no matter what decision, God can redeem all things and work his plan out through any story or within any situation. Here was a blind man who had outlived the day that he was supposed to see and God gives him sight. God tells him to be obedient and he makes his world light up and gives him images for the very first time. What had happened with me is about three months later, with praying we heard on the radio that there was an extension campus down here from one of the Christian schools up there and what it turned out was that this extension campus can take your credits and combine them from the different colleges you've gone to make a program out of it and within a year I had had my bachelor's degree because I had enough credits from other universities it worked out better for me in the long run now, whether it I had stayed in Michigan, that might have been God's will for me to go to school up there because I eventually ended back up there for seminary anyway, which brought me to the church where I met Dwayne and Cindy at. However, moving down here could have been God's will because I ended up going to school anyway and we spent time with family, we made friends and, and those experiences I wouldn't trade for the world. So what I want you to see in this story is that no matter what you choose, as long as you're being obedient to God, whether you choose plan A or plan B, God can do all things and use that plan. He can recreate a plan. Even if you fall out of God's plan and you're not obedient and you're not in his will, you can get back in his will and become obedient again. It's a story of redemption. It's a miracle of redemption. It's a miracle that this man was in the darkness. Even though the sin wasn't his, he was living in the darkness because of the sin in the world. He sees Jesus and Jesus does something, becomes obedient and what happens is he gets to see for the very first time. That's what happens when we become believers. We see for the very first time. Now here's the dangerous thing. Is that we can always go back to the darkness. Here's the dangerous thing as a believer. The man becomes healed. He shows up to the Pharisees and the Pharisees say, you know what, this isn't the man. He just looks like the man. Someone says, you know what, this, yeah, it could be him, but no. Who did this? And they begin to question. You see, the Pharisees, the teachers within the church, the people that were supposed to know are the ones that were living in the darkness at that time. They didn't understand the power of God. They didn't understand what Jesus could do in their life. I have a story very similar to that. When I became a believer, my life began to change. My brothers come to me and they say, hey, let's go out. Let's go party. We're in Vegas for a birthday party at one time. And, and they say, hey, let's go party. Let's go drink. Let's do this. And I said, you guys, I don't, I, don't, I don't feel like doing that. Oh, just tell your wife to chill out we know you Chris we know the true you we know the real you we know what you're like and and just just tell her that we're just gonna go out for a little bit and it's okay it's just one night I said guys you don't understand you see my brothers thought that I was doing my obedience because of my wife but I was trying to be obedient to God my life was changing. I was becoming different. I was becoming transformed. And I wanted to be obedient to God. And I was surrendering things to God. Yeah, we should all applause to that because God's going to do that for all of your lives. He will. He will transform you if you become obedient surrender. And so I wanted to set this example. And I said, no, guys, I, I just don't feel like doing that. God put a different passion in my heart now. It's not to go out and party and drink. And I, I'm okay with having a little bit of alcohol and drinking and have a good time. Okay? But I didn't want to go out and do what they wanted to do. So I was like, guys, no, it's not because of my wife. It's because of my obedience. But they didn't see that at the time because they were still blind. That's my point is sometimes there will be people that will try to pull you back into the darkness because they don't understand. There will be people, misery loves company, and they'll try to pull you back down because they don't understand that God's lifting you up and he's doing something in your life. So where are you today? Are you blind questioning why is God doing something in your life? Has Jesus shown up and is he the light for you and you're living in that moment? Maybe you're seeing something for the very first time like something putting on a light to the room and you're just like, ah, that's an aha moment. Or maybe you're trying to resist the temptation of them pulling you back down. These Pharisees wanted to pull down this person's belief. They said, this isn't the man. He says, yes, I am. I am the man who was blind. 
Jesus healed me. I am different today and I'm celebrating that. Where are you in the story? Do you need to be obedient to God this morning? And surrender something to him to walk that distance blind with spit on your eyes and become obedient for God to do something in your life. He can do it at any time whether you're trying to find his will. Close your eyes this morning and let's pray together. Father God, I thank you for calling us here to church to worship you. I thank you for making us a, a body of believers, of Christians who You've shown us your son, Jesus. You light up our world. You light up our faith. And maybe we're here this morning still living in darkness and we just stumbled through these doors, Lord, and we don't know why we're here. But now you're speaking to our hearts. Father, thank you for your son, Jesus, who died on the cross for our sins, who is the light of the world. Thank you for your redemption. And Father, maybe we're in that piece of the story where we're trying to figure out your way. And we're walking and we're blind, but we're walking. Sometimes it's a transformational process where it takes years to walk to that pool and wash off, to become baptized and become clean. We're stuck. We got one foot in the world and we got one foot in the church. And we're walking though. And Father, you're going to coach us. You're going to scream at us. You're going to encourage us. You're going to teach us. You're going to lead us. You're going to guide us. Father, do not give up on us and don't let us give up on ourselves. Our mind or our body can do far more than what our mind is capable of. We think that we're, ain't, we're not able to do it, but we can. We can overcome that sin in our life. We can be different. We can transform. We can have different relationships. We can practice forgiveness even when we don't want to. We can restore our marriages. We can overcome our addictions. We can become more like your son, Jesus. Not by ourselves, but through your grace. Help us believe that this morning. And when we wash off, just like when we were baptized and we're clean and we can see for the very first time, don't let somebody else pull us back down. Don't let somebody pop our bubble. Don't let the evil one get back in and whisper things into our ear. Protect us, Lord, to believe that you have washed us, that you have made us clean, and that we do see, and we are that individual that you care about enough to save. Give us that faith this morning, Lord. We pray to you, and we depend on you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Stand to your feet this morning.